And now I would like to introduce our first speaker of the day, Jessica Grootman. She is an analyst with Kaleido Insights, a research and advisory firm in San Francisco. I fir first heard her speak at the Future of Privacy Forum annual meeting and was impressed with her ability to easily explain complex and dynamic topics. And we have worked with her and her team over the past few months on the white paper, which we're releasing today. Please join me in welcoming Jessica Grootman. All right, good morning. Humans shape technologies. We shape the tools that we make, and in turn, our tools shape us. They shape how we think about ourselves, they shape how we interact and transact with each other, and they also shape how we protect ourselves. Today I'm gonna to talk about one of the most powerful emerging tools in humanity's toolkit, the rise of artificial intelligence, and specifically what it means for family online safety. As for me, this dynamic between humans and tools is one that as a former archeologist turned technologist has always fascinated me. Um, and now what we see is artificial intelligence is starting to infuse all of our tools around us. I don't look at ancient tools anymore, rather I look at about 30 different emerging tools. I run a firm called Kaleido Insights that analyzes about a kaleidoscope of technologies, if you like, and the impact that these technologies will have on people, on organizations, and also across society and broader ecosystems. Now, I specialize in AI and its commercial applications, and government applications, consumer applications, but it has been a real honor and pleasure to work with the Family Online Safety Institute and look at really what this technology or series of technologies means for our kids and for family safety. Thank you to the Family Online Safety Institute for assembling all of us here today to talk policy, to talk parenting, to talk best practices in industry and beyond. And as they've mentioned, I'm proud to announce the publication of our white paper that we've written, which you can find upstairs. Now today I just have a few minutes, I'm gonna talk through at a high level about this white paper uh, and offer a few examples. But set a baseline first for what really are we talking about when we talk about artificial intelligence? Secondly, there are both risks and opportunities that are emerging as a result of these new capabilities. Finally, so what? How do we shift the culture around technology today towards a culture of more responsibility where everyone has a much clearer understanding of their roles and responsibilities? Not just in 2020, but far beyond that. All right, now for a lot of us, trying to understand and define artificial intelligence can feel a lot like this. Everyone seems to have their own definition, and certainly if you ask a technologist, they would say something along the lines of, you know, a series uh, of techniques in computer science and advanced statistics and probabili probabilities which render machines intelligent. Methods like machine learning, deep learning, natural language processing, computer vision. And while this is important, this is true, these are the techniques that are used, this is not a definition that's necessarily accessible to everyone. It's critical that we understand not just how a technology works, but also what it enables. So we offer this as a maybe more evergreen, forward-looking definition. What we're talking about when we talk about artificial intelligence is humans' attempt to create a variety of methods and tools which mimic cognitive functions. The artificial part is the mimicry, and the cognitive functions part is the intelligence. Now, what, do I'm talking, what am I talking about when I say cognitive functions? In our analysis of over 300 different use cases of AI, what we find is that they all fall into one or more of three different macro categories. First, we're giving machines language, the ability to read and speak and communicate with us as we humans communicate with one another. This has all kinds of examples, from chatbots to voice recognition, from language translation to big textual analysis techniques that are already used in our parental controls app and school monitoring apps. Secondly, we're giving machines the ability to perceive, to perceive ourselves and our world, object recognition, image recognition, facial recognition, also using big sensor data to sense heat or pressure or proxemics, haptics, to localize if you're a drone or a self-driving car, using sensor data to understand our environments and also ourselves. The third category is around analysis. We're teaching machines to learn, to think, dare we say. But really this is about pattern recognition. 
Humans are in, in inputting parameters into machines to better understand and recognize patterns. And again, many different examples from big risk analysis, which we'll talk more about today, to energy optimization, to the, to the product or media video recommendations that we're all familiar with and we're already starting to see some of the risks emerging from those capabilities. At the highest level, we might think of artificial intelligence as information systems mimicking biological systems. But it's really important for us to remember that we are in phase one, the very early days of artificial intelligence and its applications. So now that we have a baseline definition for AI, how then do we think about some of the risks that it presents, as well as some of the opportunities that it presents to safety, to kids' safety? Well, the approach that we took in our white paper was to analyze six different AI-driven transitions in both the online world as well as in the physical world. And I'm just gonna talk through two today. Transition number one. We are watching this movement from chatbots to personal assistants. We're probably all familiar with chatbots in, say, a customer service context, and probably even the Alexas and Siri's and the Google assistants of the world. But increasingly, these capabilities are taking on new functions and also new formats. Take, for example, a real-world company called the Wobot. This is a mental health services chatbot which is, whose algorithms are trained on cognitive behavioral therapy techniques which inform how this chatbot responds to individuals and support and categorize how it analyzes and learns about each individual use, user over time. Imagine when these personal assistants become our child's first playmate. A recent study by MIT found that already kids between the ages of six and 10 feel that uh, voice interactive toys are more intelligent than they are even when these toys offer fairly narrow capabilities. Imagine when these personalized assistants become our most forgiving tutors as we're continuing have to have to learn new skill sets for the digital age. Imagine when they become our trusty sidekicks to find a date or maybe even a job or our go-to counsel after many, many years to make life's biggest decisions. After all, such a personalized assistant would have years of individualized data every step, every social media post, every search, all manner of biometrics, particularly as these personalized assistants are going into hearables, into cars, into homes, into healthcare offices, and so forth. Indeed, more information than a mother could ever hope to have about her own child. Now, what does this mean for kids in their decision-making? What we find when we analyze any specific use case for artificial intelligence is that they present both risks and opportunities. Take, for example, the fact that we're infusing software to learn about ourselves. Any software can be hacked or manipulated or designed to influence decision making. What does this mean for agency? What does it mean for privacy and security? Particularly when such tools are developed by commercial entities held to business models and revenue generating standards and metrics. Now, simultaneously, we see brand new risks. We are creating new tools for personalized risk assessment to better inform us of, say, our uh, tendency to self-harm or situations that might trigger us or even something as, as sort of simple as if I'm, if I'm asthmatic, going into uh, predicting different areas for air quality. All kinds of new capabilities for our own personalized risk assessment. This has never existed before. Simultaneously, we are creating tools that are always on, accessible to anyone. Just taking the example of mental health, there are millions of people in this country, an estimated one out of five, who suffer from some sort of mental illness, many kids included. This opens up access, at the very least, to some of those folks. Let's look at another example. We're watching a transition from analog, what's sometimes called dumb buildings, to cognitive infrastructure. Now, this is happening in every realm of our lives, from home to car to office buildings to municipal infrastructure, but critical for kids' online safety is where it's happening in schools. We already see a $3 billion industry of school monitoring and surveillance software. An example of a company called eHall Pass, which has kids register every time they go to the bathroom or the principal's office or the gym. All manner of tools monitoring uh, educational performance and beyond, both in the classroom and outside. But what we're also talking about here is this rise of the Internet of Things, of connected infrastructure in our schools. 
from door locks to identification systems to lighting, HVAC, uh, to all those cameras which increasingly are enabled with cognitive features and facial recognition and beyond. In China, they're already testing headsets which monitor kids' brain waves to make sure that they're paying attention. Now, inevitably, schools will transition, transform into big children's data hubs. School administrators are already grappling with this. A recent survey from CDW found that 80% of K through 12 decision makers think about the benefits of IoT as outweighing the risks, but this tension is being put to the test every single day. What does it mean then? What will the role be of educational institutions? What role will they play in data stewardship? Once again, new questions and risks and opportunities on both sides. As we increasingly generate data about students, are we inadvertently creating data debt? In other words, are we sharing this data, behavioral data, disciplinary data, developmental data, for college admissions, for employment opportunities, for loan approvals? Or does this data stay in a school? It's important for us to talk about how these tools or access to these tools and exposure to these tools are inadvertently potentially increasing the digital divide. Who has access to technologies, to data, to tools and exposure and training around these technologies and who does not? Simultaneously, we see major opportunities, already many examples of, of physical safety improvements in schools because of these technologies. One of the companies that we interviewed for our research called Bark, uh, who uses machine learning for social media and beyond monitoring, claims to have prevented uh, 16 school shootings as a result of this. Again, using that language capability to, to analyze and, and monitor uh, language as students are posting about these. Improved harm prevention, the same company alleges 10,000, I believe, examples of preventing self-harm of kids. And finally, we don't really have a shared forum to train and teach and standardize around digital citizenship today. This is happening all over. In, in interviews that I conducted, it's happening at home, it's happening in school, it's happening in community forums, it's happening at church. Depends. We don't have, as maybe you and I had a shared class for civics, uh, we don't have this sort of standard forum today. And, and introducing a school environment, introducing this curricula into a school environment is a huge opportunity to improve online safety. All right, so I've just talked through two examples and we see that both opportunities and risks come out of both of these examples. And there are four more, check them out on the white paper. But ultimately, what do we need? How do we transition from what is today a, a culture around technology, around speed, advancing as quickly as possible? unilateral approaches where companies don't really share their techniques and tactics. Uh, they sort of approach online safety often reactively when it's too late after a crisis has occurred. How do we transition to a culture of responsibility? As these technologies infuse all of us in all of our world, they become a shared responsibility and it takes a village. We are all together navigating uncharted territory here. So when I say it takes a village, who are we talking about? Well, we are proud to offer you a starting point, a framework. These are some of the findings that we have uh, discovered in our analysis of sort of what are the roles and what are the starting points or actions for each of these roles. Don't worry, you don't have to read this on the screen. I think it's on page 17 of the white paper. Uh, but when we talk about government, law enforcement, industry, parents, educators, and yes, even kids, what are the actions that we all need to be taking? Also, what are the shared responsibilities? How do we approach this from evidence and research and not fear? How do we actually infuse a multilateral approach into safeguarding these new technologies? And how do we keep up as, te as technology, AI is one of many emerging technologies, as they're constantly evolving? From leaders to lawmakers, from parents to police officers, from doctors to designers, teachers to teenagers, we all have a role in shaping the adoption and governance of our future technologies. All right, so in quick summary, when we talk about artificial intelligence, we're talking about humans' attempt to mimic cognitive functions in machines. And this will transform our relationship with information and how we make decisions, as well as how we interface with the physical world as what constitutes a data generating event happens all around us now, not just on the screen. Secondly, AI is presenting both risks 
to safety, as well as brand new opportunities we've yet to confront. And it also presents new risks and opportunities to kids' development, to economic opportunities that are available to all of us, and to our abilities to secure and protect everyone. Finally, it demands a culture of responsibility. Many of these emerging technologies, data-driven technologies, are ecosystem technologies, and they require that we take a multilateral approach. It takes a village, and indeed, we all have a role here. I started with stone tools, and I'm gonna end with stone tools, because there's always a lesson to be learned. Uh, it's been said often that to date, or sorry, the Stone Age has been marked by our, the Stone Age was marked by our clever use of crude tools, and that the information age has to date been marked by our crude use of very clever tools. And so I urge us to think about and ask this question today, how do we enable our most clever, our most responsible and safe use, or maybe of maybe our most clever tool yet? Thank you all very much. <laughs>